So things that we have learned so far when it comes to exploring a distribution for a variable that's continuous. So we have a variable that's quantitative and the way it's distributed is continuous. So it's very important to always graph your data. Always look at, at what the data look like. Look for any unusual patterns or outliers. It doesn't mean that you need to necessarily remove these points, but it's definitely worth mentioning. Uh, sometimes these uh, outliers or patterns will definitely impact what uh, whatever uh, tests you end up doing. And then calculate the appropriate measures of center and spread. So remember, if it's nice and symmetric, we like to use the mean and the standard deviation. However, if it's very skewed or if we have extreme outliers, we tend to use the median and the IQR. So in general, what we like to do is we like to get a distribution such that we can draw it as a smooth line over a histogram. And this is a, what we call a density curve. So here are a couple histograms with density curves drawn over them. It's a little hard, it's a little fine. So we have the histogram, which are the gray bars. And then if we zoom in, if it'll let me, there is a red, I can't draw in and zoom. There's a red curve fit to that. Similarly, if we look over here, here's a histogram of red line was fit to that as well. So those are density curves. So a couple facts about them. They are always on or above the horizontal x-axis. So this is my x, this is my y. You cannot go below. This is not allowed. It, it can be like this, but it cannot go below. Big no-no. And then it has an area of exactly one underneath the curve. So think of it as like 100% of the area is underneath that curve. So if you add all that area up, and if you've gone through calculus, you might know what I'm talking about here. Uh, all of the area underneath should be one. So talking histograms versus density curves. So the histogram is going to provide an exact proportion. So for example, we have these vocabulary scores and you might want to see, okay, what proportion of the vocabulary scores were at or less than a uh, six. And I'm not really familiar with the scale, but it looks like it goes to about 12 or so. So here we can actually add up, they have them shaded in, those orange bars, uh, there's 287 um, out of the 947, so 0.303. So a little less than a third of the folks in, in uh, that histogram had a, a six or lower. However, if we use the density curve instead, so instead we fit to this red uh, density curve, and we go at six or less. The probability we end up getting there, so it's an approximation, is about, it's 0.293. These two, they're pretty similar. So the argument is saying if you fit a curve really well to your histogram, if you use the area um, under the curve to estimate the area in the bars, you're gonna get something pretty close. So that's the idea here is we're justifying, we're gonna fit a curve and uh, use the curve to find the areas. So some notation, we need to talk about the spread and the center, but we also need to distinguish when we're talking about spread and center from a sample and spread and center from the population. So when we have actual observations from a, a data set, so we, we collect a sample and uh, we collect a, a mean and a, a standard deviation, we are going to use, so this is X bar, it's X with a bar over it, is that's the sample mean. And then S, a lot of times we might even write S uh, with an X underneath. 
Either way, it's totally fine. That's the sample standard deviation. So the letter S tells me it's from a sample. In general, anytime that there's a, a bar or a hat, um, it usually means it coming, it's coming from the sample. And then if I am fitting a density curve to population data, so if I have a histogram of every, every individual in that population, I would use, so this is mu of x, so this is a Greek letter, it's mu, and it's not an m, so like it goes down on one side but not on the other side. So be careful, don't write the letter m, we will jump on that every time. And then this is sigma, so uh, anytime, most of the time you see Greek letters, they are going to relate to something to do with the population. So mu for the population mean, and that's saying, hey, where is it centered in the population? And then sigma is going to tell us about uh, how it's spread out in the population. So when we decide that something's roughly normally distributed, we have an equation for how we get this bell-shaped curve that we fit. And this is the equation. Do we want you to memorize it? No, please don't. It's really complicated. Look at it. It's really gnarly. And the idea is if you know where it's centered, you actually plug in a number here. And if you know how it's spread, so you know the uh, population standard deviation, you plug in those numbers there. It's really gnarly to actually m graph this by hand. This is something that we usually won't do. Just know that this equation is how you get this curve. So a couple of things. The mean is the center of that distribution. So right here where it's centered, that that is going to be what you plug in from you. Then one other thing that's really important is talking about the standard deviation. So we will use sigma for it. Um, you might use sigma x. I'm going to try and stick to sigma x. Um, and it tells us like how spread out the data are. So one way you can think about it in this, um, in this context, it's when, when the curve goes from this shape to this shape. So where that changes, this distance is what sigma is. There's some calculus that goes into calculating it. Don't worry, we don't have to actually uh, do proofs for any of that. So once we have our normal curve, so we know it's normally shaped, it's bell shaped, we have mu where it's centered, and then we have sigma that tells us how spread out it is, we a lot of times will use this notation where um, capital N, it's really important to capital N, and then we'll have a number here for mu, and comma, and then a second number for sigma. So the first number is always the mean, the second number is always the standard deviation or the spread. So some facts here. The bigger your standard deviation is, the more spread out your data is. So the bigger sigma is, the wider it gets. The smaller uh, your sigma or standard deviation is, the thinner it gets, right? So it gets, it gets more um, narrow. So things to remember, the area has to stay one, right? So if it gets wider, it has to get shorter. If it gets narrower, it has to get taller in order to make sure that the area underneath is still one. Okay, so normal distributions, they're probably one of the most, if not the most popular uh, distribution that we use in statistics. It's definitely something that you will see a lot. And one of the things that's great about it is there are a lot of things that when you, you sample, they are approximately normally distributed. Um, a lot more than you would think. Um, we are going to end up using it a lot for sampling distributions, so that's going to come up next week. Uh, the big thing is they're all, they're symmetric, they're, so if I drew a line down the middle, they're totally just equal on both sides. 
Um, and then you have total mirror images. They have a single peak. They're that bell shape. Not only that is a normal distribution. Oops. It goes on forever in both directions, right? So uh, they don't ever stop. It's not like it goes here and it just stops here. No, it actually just, it keeps going. Just the area gets really, really close to zero out there. And then we define it by those two parameters. So the mu, mu or mu of x, that tells us where it's centered. And the standard deviation sigma tells us how it's spread out. And here are just a few handy examples just to show you. Like this orange one, this is a normal distribution with a mean of 3 and a standard deviation of 0.5. This blue one, this one's actually a really, really popular um, one in particular. That's a normal with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one and so on. So this is a really handy little rule here. Uh, I've heard it called the 68959997 rule and that's quite a mouthful. I've also heard it called the empirical rule. Whichever you call it, we're totally fine with either. Um, so the idea is it's useful for approximating area underneath the curve. So if you know that that x, so this is whatever x is, it's roughly normal with a mean of whatever mu of x is, and standard deviation with whatever sigma is, you can use uh, th this property. So roughly 68%, so 68% or 0.68, and we're not gonna be too picky if you use proportion versus percent, but if you use percent, make sure you have a percent sign because we will um, it's off by a factor of 100 if uh, you don't put the percent sign on. So that means that this is roughly the middle 68% of the data that if, you know, the mean minus one standard deviation to the mean plus one standard deviation, that's roughly the middle 68%. If I go out two standard deviations from the middle, that is roughly 95%, so the middle 95% of the data roughly. And remember, this is an approximation, so it's not exact. And then if I go out three standard deviations, that's the middle 99.7% roughly of the data. And do you know that there's still area out here? It's just really, really tiny, right? So the, the probability of being out here is not zero, but it's small. So this particular example, we're going to exhaust it. Uh, we love this bridge example. So we have a particular bridge we're looking at and they're going ahead and recording the speeds of the vehicles on this bridge. And the average is 58 miles per hour, which makes me a little nervous. At least I come from the Bay Area in California. This seems a little fast for a bridge, but whatever. So here they're describing that it's most probable at 58 miles per hour. And I'm gonna write miles per hour down here somewhere and that further away from 58 the probability gets less so it the probability is really high here see it's really up high but then it goes down and down the further from 58 you get specifically we're going to assume it's normally distributed and the distribution of speeds is symmetric with a standard deviation of 10 miles per hour so my parameters for this distribution starting off well they told us the mean so x is just speeds of vehicle. So mean of the speeds of vehicles, that's 58 miles per hour. The standard deviation of the speed of vehicles was that 10 miles per hour. So this comes up a lot. We say, hey, draw the distribution by hand. So we want you to make a bell shape and we want you to have, well, I like to draw a line down the middle. You don't have to, but, uh, and then we want you to fill in these 
seven numbers. So we want the middle and then we want to label three tick marks to either side. That's what we want. We don't need to use this notation um, when we fill this out. So for this, I like to start here and then I adding 10 is going to be pretty easy. So 68, 78, 88. And then the other way around, so 58 minus 10 is 48, minus 10 is 38, minus 10 is 28. And know that it is going to go forever in both directions. Eventually you'll get to negative numbers, but the probability is going to be so tiny that we're not going to really worry about it. So here I can go ahead and I can use that empirical rule to answer this question. What is the probability I randomly select a vehicle and that vehicle is going between 48 and 68 miles per hour? So between 48, just pretend that line is straighter, and 68. So I am looking at the mean plus or minus one standard deviation. So this would be around 0.68 or 68%. So there's a probability about 68% of the time I randomly select a vehicle, it's going between 48 and 68 miles per hour. Then another one here. I'm just going to fill this out again. So 58, 68, 78, 88, 48. 38, 28, this is miles per hour. So what is the probability we randomly select a vehicle and it's going more than 78 miles per hour? So I'm going to draw my line at 78 miles per hour and I'm going to shade in, I want this more than, right? So uh, I'm going to take this one half at a time. So I would argue, well, looking here, so if I were looking between 38 and 78, that's two standard deviations, right? Uh, so this would be like the middle 95%. But if I cut down in half, and you're only allowed to cut in half down the middle, you're not allowed to cut down in half like over here or anywhere else, only down the middle. Just this part right here, so just this shaded part, I could describe this as 0.95 over two, that's gonna be what, 0.475, because I don't want this half right here. And then, so now I have just this wedge right here. This dark purple wedge is 0.475. I would argue everything under 58, this is 0.5 right here. Then I'm just going to use what I know about the area. The area under the entire thing is one, right? So that's one minus, I don't want this, this half wedge right here. So minus 0.5 minus, I don't want this purple wedge right here, right? I actually now want this part. So minus 0.475. So it, I mean, you can simplify it ends up being one minus 0.975 you're going to get roughly 0.025. So this shaded area, that's roughly about 0.025. So if I were to randomly select uh, a car um, driving across this uh, bridge, about 2.5% of the time, I'm going to pick a car that's going more than 78 miles per hour. So this wedge right here. And I just like to have things labeled. It's easier for me. If you were to add these three wedges, so this is the first, this is the second, this is the third, you should get to one. If you ever add up all the wedges and they don't add to one, something went wrong. So that's our empirical rule. We'll join uh, you next for the talking more about normal distributions in lesson 18.